Good morning and welcome to this morning's Open Heaven Church service. It's fantastic to be able to be with you this morning. And this morning we're going to be talking about love. And we're going to be talking about that for the next few weeks, where we're looking at the different types of love that are expressed and shown in the Bible. And the English language is pretty rubbish when it comes to love, because we've got this one word, love, and we use it for all the different types of love that there actually are. But we're going to explain over the next couple of weeks or so all the different types of love that there are. And the Greek language of which the New Testament is written in shows as easily what each of those different types of love because they all have a different name. And we'll be explaining that as we go through the services over the next few weeks. But we hope you've had a brilliant time. Lots of people have been on holiday and the weather's been amazing for that holiday. So hopefully everybody's got great tans and had a really good and relaxing week. Let's pray. Lord, you love us. You died on the cross for us. And you showed just what love actually is. And we're here, Lord, for you. We're here praising your name. We are here reciprocating the love that you have shown us and given us. And we just pray, Lord, that everybody can express the love that they have for you throughout their lives in all aspects what they do how they do it but today we're going to express that love through worship as well amen and let's do that let's worship
So as I said, this morning we're going to be talking about love and how love is shown and explained in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 13 says this, three things will last forever, faith, hope and love, and the greatest of these is love. Now there are different types of love, so let's introduce each of these different types of love 
so that we can understand the background and the basics of what we're going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks. So the first, and the one that I think most people think about when they think about love, is eros. Now that's the passionate, sensual type of love. Desire, where you see somebody and, 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 we, and you, know, you come together with somebody. Now that is not mentioned in the Bible by name. And next one is storge. Now that's where you have affection and acceptance of people. And again, that too is not mentioned in the Bible by name. The third is phileo, and that is discipleship or brotherly love. And when the Bible talks about love as love, when it mentions the word love, 15% of the time it is talking about phileo. And then the final is agape. And that is unconditional, deep love for another person. And 80% of the time that the Bible talks about love, it talks about agape. Today we're going to look at eros, this passionate, sensual, desire type of love. And how the Bible speaks of that and what it says. And, and that is the type of love that leads to things like dating and relationships. And, you know, when you first experience it, it has a lot to do with beauty. Who you find attractive, whether that is personality-wise, but mostly physically attractive. Many of the songs that we hear, you know, that we sing and songs that are in the charts uh, and, and such forth are actually about this type of love. And many films are about this type of love. You know, boy meets girl, are they going to get together? Does the other person reciprocate the attraction that somebody feels for them? And if not, how are they going to get together? How, how is this going to work? And that's what you would tend to see in songs, it's what we tend to see in films. We also do see this in the Bible. It doesn't specifically mention it by name, but we see its effects. We see stories about people that are experiencing eros. So let's look at one of these, Samson. In Judges chapter 14, verses 1 to 2, Samson says this, sorry, the Bible says this. One day when Samson was in Timnah, one of the Philistine women caught his eye. When he returned home, he told his father and mother, a young Philistine woman in Timnah caught my eye. I want to marry her, get her for me. Now, Samson liked women, yeah? And, and this, this woman, he liked her, and he told his parents to get her. Now, the problem was, is that the Philistines used this woman to try and get to Samson. And Samson knew what was going on and he played along with the game. And one of the things he did was he told them a riddle. And he said, if you can figure this riddle out, you know, I'll, I'll tell you things. And so they could not figure this actual riddle out. And the Bible tells us the consequences of what happens. So let's have a look at what happens here. Three days later, they were still trying to figure it out, it being the riddle. On the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, entice your husband to explain the riddle for us, or we will burn down your father's house with you in it. Did you invite us to this party just to make us poor? So Samson's wife came to him in tears and said, you don't love me. You hate me. You have given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. I haven't even given the answer to my father or mother, he replied. Why should I tell you? So she cried whenever she was with him and kept it up for the rest of the celebration. At last, on the seventh day, he told her the answer because she was tormenting him with her nagging. Then she explained the riddle to the young men. Now, there's lots of consequences for this. You know, Samson's given a riddle to a bunch of people and, and he knows that they won't be able to figure that riddle out. But they know the answer to uh, how to get the actual answer and that is through his wife. And she nags him and nags him and nags him 
until he breaks down and tells her the answer. And there's a lot of consequences for this. So let's have a look at what some of the consequences actually are. The first thing is, is that Samson leaves his wife and kills 30 men. His wife then gets married off to another man, which en enrages Samson even more. And what he ends up doing then is that he ends up burning a bunch of fields to the ground and the lords blame his wife for that because, you know, because it's his wife's fault that Samson got mad, clearly. Um, but they then murder Samson's wife as revenge for what Samson does. So nothing good actually comes from this relationship that Samson had. Does Samson learn from this? Well, no, he doesn't, because he then falls for another woman. And again, this relationship is not good. Now, I'm not... I'm going to be clear here, I'm not blaming the women in this because at the end of the day, Samson is just as culpable. What I'm saying here is that this is an example how letting desire without common sense get in the way, you know, bad things can happen in your life. We have to be sensible and Eros is very useful. We all feel it, but... If we let it take control and we don't look at what the potential consequences are, then we can get ourselves into deep trouble. So let's see again what happens the next time Simon gives in to Eros. Sometime later, Samson fell in love with a woman named Delilah who lived in the Valley of Sorek. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, Entice Samson to tell you what makes him so strong and how he can be overpowered and tied up securely. Then each of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me what makes you so strong and what it would take to tie you up securely. Now, Samson gives Delilah three different reasons going forward from this about why he is so strong. And he's so blind that when they, each of these reasons get tested, he just carries on. He's either blind or arrogant, one or the other, or possibly both. But in verse 7, he says, If you tie me up with seven new bowstrings that are not yet dry, dried, I'll lose my strength. In verse 11, he says, tie up with brand new ropes that have not been used. And in verse 13, he says, weave seven braids of hair into the fabric of clothes. Now, each time, these things are tested. So he knows that Delilah is telling this information to somebody, but he is so blinded by his desire that he carries on. By verse 15, Delilah says this, How can you love me when you don't confide in me? So in verse 17, he actually gives in, and he tells Delilah the truth, and he says, My strength comes because my hair has never been cut. And immediately again, Delilah tells the Philistines, he knows this must be coming, because it happened with the other three times he told Delilah what might cause his strength. And his hair gets cut, he gets caught, his hair gets cut, and, you know, disaster happens. There is a loss of focus, is the consequence of Samson's desire for Delilah. And there is a loss of judgment. He is so overruled by Eros, and he's allowing himself to be overruled by Eros, that he has a loss of judgment and he has a loss of focus. Anybody with half a brain, and I'm sure we've all known people where we've said, are you really going to do this? Because this is crazy. You know, it doesn't make sense. But we can be overrun by desire, and we carry on. Another person who was overrun by Eros was David. Now, again, we know of David. He was the boy who killed Goliath. He united Israel. He brought the ark to Jerusalem. And he was an ancestor of Jesus. That is an incredible pedigree. It's a list of achievements by David that you think, this is amazing. 
But he still, in one fleeting moment, he allowed Eros to overtake his judgment and there were massive consequences for what happened. So let's read from 2 Samuel chapter 11. Late one afternoon, as after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He, wa he sent someone to find out who she was. What he should have done is avert his eyes and go back in. Instead, he felt desire and worse, he acted on that desire. Now, desire in itself is not a bad thing, as I've said before, but misplaced desire, especially when acted on, can be disastrous. And in here, it was disastrous because what happened next was that he found out this woman's name was Bathsheba. He invited her over and she got pregnant. Now she was married, but her husband was fighting in the wars for David. Now David needed to cover up what he had done. He needed to cover up his indiscretion. One error caused by desire led to another error. And that error was Bathsheba was pregnant, so he needed to cover it up. So he brought Bathsheba's husband back. Now, he was an honourable man, and he said, no, um, I um, should be on the front line. I am not going to sleep with my wife. That led to a problem, because if, you, if Uriah didn't get his wife pregnant, how was David to cover up the pregnancy? Let's see what David does. So the next morning, David wrote a le letter to Joab and gave it to Uriah to deliver. The letter instructed, instructed Joab, station Uriah on the front lines where the battle is fiercest. Then pull back so that he will be killed. So Joab assigned Uriah to a spot, a spot close to the city wall where he knew the enemy's strongest men were fighting. And when the enemy soldiers came out of the city to fight, Uriah the Hittite was killed along with several other Israelite soldiers. The consequence of David's acting on his desire in a moment of madness was that he then ended up, by proxy, committing murder. He sentenced Bathsheba's husband Uriah to death to cover up his own transgressions. And if we act unwisely at times of desire, we might well end up doing something even worse unwisely to cover up what we did in that time of desire. The Bible goes on to say this. Tell Joab not to be discouraged, David said. The sword devours this one today and that one tomorrow. Fight harder next time and conquer the city. David didn't even at that point recognise how far gone he was. And it took somebody else to point it out to him. The prophet Nathan had to tell David how far gone he was. He didn't think of the consequences he starts the scheme and he became callous to the consequences of his scheming. But as I said, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, David receives this message. This is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give you wives to another man before your very eyes and he will go to bed with them in public view. There were going to be consequences for what David did. And David finally got it. He finally understood that giving in to his desires without thought of consequence led to bad things. And he ended up writing this psalm, Psalm 51, which begins this. Have mercy on me, O, o God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion. Blot out the stains of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. He knew he had messed up. 
He knew he had done wrong. And he recognised the consequences. Too late to stop those consequences, but he recognised those consequences. So can Eros ever be good? Because I've talked about the bad things. Can it ever be good? Well, of course it can. Look about things like the Song of Songs, you know, the book of the Bible. These are a, poem, these are a set of poems between a man and a woman who are married. It's, their man, it's man and wife on their wedding day. You know, they're remembering their courtship, they're remembering their engagement, and there's lots of imagery of Eros within those poems. You know, Eros within a relationship leading to marriage, that is good. Eros, outside of that context, can be an absolute disaster that leads us down paths that lead to terrible consequences. We have to remember, though, that even in marriage, Eros will fade, and we have to do things to rekindle that love. And other types of love are needed to sustain a relationship. If you base your relationship purely on Eros, it will fail. And the problem is, if you are only interested in experiencing Eros, you will not have a sustainable, long-term, viable relationship. You will go looking for new Eros from somebody else. And that's what leads to disaster in marriages and relationships.
So we hope you enjoyed today's service and it's made you think about different types of expression of love. As I say, over the next couple of weeks after today, we're also going to be looking at other types of love and going deeper into what they mean. But, you know, this week, think about how Eros is brilliant for relationships when directed in the correct manner, but also make sure that we keep a check on how we are not being directed by Eros down the wrong path. Have a fantastic week. I'm going to close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this week. We thank you for the coming week and all the people that we're going to meet. We thank you, Lord, for the relationships that you form in our life, the relationships with people that we love and the different types of love that we experience. By understanding different types of love, Lord, we can understand that it's not wrong to love people. It, we can understand the, the love that you have for us and we can talk about love in a much more open way without thinking, oh, well, you know, this is scary or, or this sounds weird because we understand that we're talking about different types of love and it is unfortunate that the English language only has one word for this. But we know, Lord, that you have given us love in many different forms for many different relationships and many different situations. So I just pray, Lord, that we can connect with the people that we love again this week. And some of it, blessedly, can be face to face again after a long 12, 15 months, we can finally meet people that we love again. And we thank you, Lord, that you've built our lives on the expression of love. We worship you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. And we just want to be with you through this week as well in all aspects of our life. Amen. Have a fantastic week. Enjoy the weather. Enjoy whatever you're going to be doing this week. And we'll see you next week. Goodbye.